بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد Special brothers and sisters <coughs> Alhamdulillah, we praise and we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting us the tawfiq to be here today. Most of you fasted, I was told, you had iftar. May Allah accept your fast, reward you, increase you in your sincerity and in your good deeds, inshaAllah, and all of us. Like the brother mentioned, I actually came to UCL I was just telling the brother who came to collect me at King's Cross about three, four years, four years, I can't remember, was it three years or four years or five years? I had a talk here. Does that, is anybody still studying right now who was there that time? Was it five? It was probably five. Nobody, nobody attending the lecture. I still know the title, so it was recorded, it's on the internet somewhere. I still remember that because it was a controversial topic and I had to talk about balancing the topic. And it was in a larger lecture theatre, I remember. There's quite a few people over there. I don't know how many years ago. Three or four or five. I'm just completely, yeah, I forget. I might maybe five years. The title was Spirit of Sufism, if I just tell you. Or the reality of Sufism. So basically trying to explain what is right and what's wrong, I remember. Today's topic is very important. Like the brother said, the hadith which... Uh, has been recorded by Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim in their respective Sahih collections. <coughs> it's a famous hadith. It's an authentic, very rigorously authenticated hadith. And you've probably ha- had a talk on the beginning or the part of, of the hadith or what, one aspect of the hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, سَبْعَةٌ يُظِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلَّ There are certain people, seven people, and the list is there in the hadith. Those people who will be under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, they'll be under the shade of Allah. On a day when there'll be no shade except Allah's shade. In other words, there'll be no protection, no refuge from anyone, from, from the difficulties, from the calamities of that day. It's a very difficult day, the, the, the day of judgment. But these people will be protected, preserved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of them, he said, and this is what our talk is focusing on today, is a person, a rajulun, talabatu imra'atun, a man who was seduced or called by a woman, talabatu, da'atu. The word in, in one of the narrations is talabatu. It's, it's a man who was trying to be seduced by a woman. Now this does not only mean a man being seduced, remember, the words in the hadith and in the Quran, sometimes there are about specific in, you know, genders, but it isn't rest- it's not restricted to that. There's a general application in many of these texts of the Quran and Sunnah. Otherwise, if everything was explained in, every, in detail, then you'd have 800 volumes of the Quran. And you'd have 200 rak'at of taraweeh and hadith as well. Like the other day, just last week I had a course somewhere and I was saying, Allah says in the Quran, He's giving a list of people who a man cannot marry. Allah says, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُكُمْ وَأَخَوَاتُكُمْ وَعَمَّاتُكُمْ There's a list. Now when Allah said, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ You can't marry your biological mother, a man cannot. Right? That doesn't mean that you can marry your grandmother. Everybody agrees. If you can't marry your mom, you can't marry your grandmother. But Allah didn't go into saying your mother, your grandmother. And if somebody has a great grandmother, then also a great great grandmother. And then if somebody, even a great great grandmother, then a great grandmother. Otherwise, you'll have a large text of the Quran. So this is generally there are general principles given in the Quran, in the Sunnah, and then you use your own understanding to see what kind of application it is. 
Likewise in this hadith, he said, a man who is seduced by a woman, invited to commit a sin by a, a woman, he said, Rajulun talabatu imra'atun. And this woman is not just any woman. Now, so it's not only restricted to a man being invited by a woman, it's also the general implication is that a woman being tried to be seduced by a man. A man tries to flirt with a woman. Right? That's also understood there. So in either case, a man being seduced by a woman or a woman being seduced by a man who are not related to him, they are not husband and wives, and, and this, this relates to also flirtatious conversation and whatever we know what's unlawful and I'll talk about some of those things. But just to read the hadith first and foremost before you. And this woman is no ordinary woman. Right? I mean if somebody was, a man was being seduced by a 105 year old woman and you say, you know what? I'm so just chased. Alhamdulillah, I had no, no intention of sinning. And an old lady with a stick can try to seduce, yeah? And I say, you know what? Inni khaf Allah, I fear Allah. And I say, mashallah, you know what? A woman tried to seduce me? And I, I'm so chased. It's no big deal. Likewise, a woman, you know, there's an old man, right? And she try, he tries to seduce or flirt with her. And of course, she probably slap him one. <laughs> what are you trying to do? So, that, that's no big deal. But a woman, in this hadith, رَجُلٌ دَعَتْهُ إِمْرَأَةٌ ذَاتُ مَنْصَبٍ وَجَمَالٍ The Messenger of Allah, صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِ He said two things. This woman is someone of beauty. In other words, there's that attraction there. The woman is someone who you are attracted to as a man. Remember, attraction and beauty is relative. You can't say this person is beautiful and this person is not. Beauty is in the, it's in the eyes of the beholder. So it's, it's a relative theory. You might find someone might find someone beautiful, others might not even look at that person twice. So, and beauty is not just in the physical appearance. It's, there's a lot of things, the way a person talks, the way a person's character is, his akhlaq or her akhlaq, adat and mannerisms and everything. So someone whom you are attracted to, a man is seduced by a woman whom he is really inclined towards. He is attracted towards that woman. And likewise a woman being encouraged to commit a sin and flirted with by a man, a flirt with her, whom she is in a way attracted to. And mansab. The second thing the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, not just a woman who has beauty and you're attracted to, it's someone of position of authority. Of, of a position and rank in, in the society, in, in, in your locality, in your community. Someone who, who has respect and someone whom you respect, you have respect for in the heart. Like a brother, you know, mashallah, this brother, his head, I'm not going to give, start giving examples of Amirs of societies and ISOCs or whatever because I did that one place and somebody said, you talking about me? I said, I'm not talking about you, it's just general. There's someone, you know, like in your locality, there's some, just someone of respect. And you look up to, to that person. You look up towards that woman or that sister or that brother. Right? This man was invited by this woman to commit a sin. <coughs> Meaning there's every possible reason for him to commit a sin. And there are no barriers. There are no barriers. It's very easy to fall into sin. Yet the only thing that is preventing and stopping this man or a woman from fornicating, and not just zina, we'll talk about some things, zina and the things that lead to fornication, all the sins he avoids and he says, Inni akhaf Allah. I fear that's the title of the talk. I fear Allah. It's actually the words of the hadith. Inni akhaf Allah. Indeed, I fear Allah. I mean that's just a, such a strong statement. Such a strong statement. In other words, he avoids the sin because of the fear of Allah. Because there's nothing that will prevent a man or a woman from committing a sin in any area of your life, of our lives, in any area except the fear of Allah. If we have the fear of Allah in our souls, in our lives, then, then that's what will prevent us from committing the sin. There's nothing else. There's nothing else. Even authority position cannot in of itself 
prevent a person from a sin. You might just, due to force and pressure of parents, of the government, or whatever you are, the authority, because of force and pressure, you might avoid some sins. But in the khalwa, in, in isolation, in seclusion, there are certain things that nobody can force. So, the fear of Allah, inni Allah, another term in the Qur'an used for fear of Allah is taqwa as well. Taqwa is a very comprehensive word. Allah says in the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhun nasu, so many places, Ya ayyuhun nasu, taqwa rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum, min nafsu wahida, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha, wa batha minuma rijalan, kathira wa nisa'a, wa attaqu Allah, and fear Allah. And Allah says, yeah, you know the three verses that are recited in the khutbah, khutbatul haja, which is the sunnah of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, which is recited before the marriage ceremony. The imam, when you go to, I mean, if, you, if anybody's married here, I don't know, but if you get married or if you know, when the imam is, is reciting the sermon, the khutbah of marriage, it's a sunnah. There are three verses that are chosen from the Qur'an and none of them have any mention of nikah or marriage in them. None of them. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi could have chosen any other verse from the Qur'an that talks about marriage. But no, all three verses have one thing in common which is taqwa. God consciousness. Being conscious and aware of the fact that everything I say, everything I do, everything I write, any gestures I make, I will be questioned about them. I will be answerable to my Lord on the Day of Judgment. Special reminder at the time of nikah, because now before marriage you were by yourself, alone. Now you have extra responsibilities. There are hukuk, there are rights and responsibilities. You're going to live 24-7 with your spouse and your children. There will be other family members. right? Remember, anything you say to your spouse, you will have to answer to Allah in the next life. That's why taqwa is being reminded, fear of Allah. It's a very important part, fear of Allah. You know, because that... If, if we realize, this is what taqwa is, if we are conscious, we realize of the fact that anything I say or do, I have to my, answer my Lord on the day of judgment about anything I say or do, or even write on the internet forums, and nobody knows who you are. Yeah, you might be on a forum somewhere, and some you might just sign off as Abdullah, and your name is probably Zainab. You know, that's what happens nowadays. People... And because anonymity, you know, now people just because of, you know, you don't know who you are, emailing here and there, people are anonymous. And, and people say all sorts of things and do all sorts of things. Only the fear of Allah, whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we write, even the actions, everything in the next life, you know, it's, there's going to be like a video being played. Everything, all the actions. Allah says, any statement, any word, any utterance, any pronouncement, anything that comes out from the mouth. مَا يَلْفِضُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ Except there's an angel making the record of everything. So we have to be very careful. This is our understanding of the next life. So in this hadith, he said, I fear Allah, right? And he avoided the sin. This fear of Allah is such a strong such a strong quality. It's just so amazing. And we need to inculcate that in our life. You know, there's another hadith as well, which, which is relating to that. It's a famous hadith in many books, Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim and elsewhere, where you might have heard of it. There were three people who, you know, there were the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said three people, they, they left, they came out, they, they were traveling. And for asabahum al there was heavy rain. So they, because of the rain, what they did, فَدَخَلُوا fi غَارٍ They went into a cave. To just save themselves from the rain. They were in the cave, what happened? A sakhra, a, a uh, massive rock, shut the entrance of the cave. They're locked inside, they can't go anywhere. They were, it was on a, in, a, in a mountain, nobody can hear them. <coughs> you know the miners? Remember the chili miners? Do you know what happened? The Chilean miners they were like there for how many years, uh, mo- days or months, I don't know. It's just like that, right in the middle of a mountain. In a cave they went there, fi jabalin and a sakhra came and blocked. So what should we do? There's no way, nobody can find us. So they said to each other, look, let's make dua to Allah. Let's pray to Allah. Let's ask Allah to just miraculously uh, remove this rock. Let's pray to Allah. Let's pray to Allah in a way that we, we ask Allah through our, some of the good deeds that we, we, we have practiced before. 
Each one of them. One of them said, Oh Allah, you know, there's two others which I don't want to go into, but I want to mention the third one. One of them said, Oh Allah, you know, he, he had parents that he stood all night long. He brought, he used to feed them milk and they went to sleep and he stood all night long till morning and they woke up and he said, Oh Allah, if I've done this for your sake only, for your pleasure, I ask you, I beg you to, to move this rock from the entrance of the cave. One third, a third of it moved. And the second one, he had something where he had someone who he had employed and then he didn't want his wages and then he came back after such a long... So he took his wages and invested it. It's a long hadith, but there's no time. I don't want to go into the details. But And, and he invested it and, and there was a lot of cattle, sheep that, that was generated from this. And he came back and he said, I want my wages back. He said, look, all of this is yours because I used... And he was quite shocked. He said, are you you know, making a mockery out of me? He said, no, this is all yours, take it. He said, oh Allah, if I done this only for your sake, remove the... Rock from the cave. Another third, two thirds. And the third one, and this is the one, I mean, this is relating to this hadith. He said, Oh Allah, and this, these are, they are making the dua. You know, they are, they are making, they, they, they are praying to Allah, they're making dua. And he said, Oh Allah, I used to have a first cousin whom I used to be in madly love. Someone that you're after, you know, for years. I want to marry her, but people are not, not allowing that. I wanted to come in. I wanted to fornicate with her for a long time. I used to love her extremely. I used to love her extremely. Extremely, I used to love her extremely. And I used to try to seduce her. She used to always say no. And then she was in a, once she got into a very desperate state. Financially, and she said, "If you get hundred dinars, then I'll allow you to fornicate with me." Right? I mean, for them, at that time, hundred dinars was like a, a lot of amount of money. It's just not, it's not like hundred pounds. It's it's a lot. Mina the dinar. So he said, "Fasaitu hatta jamatuha." I I worked for it because I was so desperate to even have one uh, session of in which I, I I am close to her. And I can unite with her. He said, فَسَعَيْتُ I tried. I worked. فَجَمَعْتُ I, I, فَجَمَعْتُ I gathered 100 dinar. Imagine working like you're thinking, oh yes. She said she wants 100. I tried to take advantage of the fact, he said, of the fact that she was financially in a very bad position and she was desperate for some money. So I went out, I worked day and night, hard, very, you know, really worked hard so that I can gather, gather money, gather the money and then... I can do whatever I want to do. And I gave it to her. And then the hadith says, subhanAllah, the words of the hadith amazing is, فَلَمَّا قَعَدْتُ This is quite open and frank. فَلَمَّا قَعَدْتُ بَيْنَ رِجْلَيْهَا When I sat in between her legs. Literal translation. That's in the hadith, right? فَلَمَّا قَعَدْتُ بَيْنَ رِجْلَيْهَا Oh Allah, I sat in between like I was there just which was the final stages of fornication, actual, illicit, and lawful sexual intercourse. Qalat, she said to me, Ittaqillah. Right at that moment, she said to me, Fear Allah. Imagine that position, that, that, that situation. Imagine what he's been working for years, gathering 100 dinar, and then he's got his way. And now he's right on the final stages and he's just about to fornicate and she says, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. If you have fear of Allah, you want Wala Tafud al Khatam. Don't break the seal. In another riwayah, Wala Taftah al Khatam. Don't open the seal. Because she was a virgin girl. She said, Fear Allah, I am desperate, right? I am desperate. And this is the reason why I'm allowing you to do this. But if you have fear of Allah, fear Allah and don't open the seal. And it hit him. This is a hadith, this is a sound hadith. وَلَا تَفُضَّ الْخَاتَمْ إِلَّا بِحَقِّهِ Unless by due right, which is through marriage, through a halal way. He said, فَقُمْتُ وَتَرَكْتُهَا As soon as I heard that, I stood up and I left. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then they, he made this dua. Oh Allah, in كُنْتَ تَعْلَمْ Oh Allah, you know for a fact. And if I do that, I did that for your, only for your pleasure, just, just for your sake, only for, because of you, Allah. No, any, no other reason. Nobody was watching me. I was there. I was able to fornicate. 
Right? It was only for the sake of Allah, not for any shame. Not because, oh, I might get caught here, or people might see us here, or something might happen. There was no way for him to get caught or anything. But only for the sake of Allah. فَفْرَجْ عَنَّا فَرْجَ Open the cave entrance and remove and, and another third was moved. And all three of them, the whole rock moved and the entrance was open. This hadith is very similar to that hadith. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to say a few things. These were just two hadith. I thought I'll start my talk off with these two hadith in time. I don't know how much time I have, but how much time do I have? Okay. It's 5.50 right now, I think. Chicken, okay. It's fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is our creator. He's created us. Right? We believe in Allah creating us. We know Allah created us. Does everybody believe that Allah created them? Okay. He's created us with certain needs and desires. Allah is the creator of the human being. On one hand, we just read the hadith. When a woman is seducing you, a woman seduces you and invites you to a sin. And you say, Inni Allah, I fear Allah. That woman said to him, Ittaqillah. He had a desire, he had a need. But he suppressed his desire, he suppressed his need. This tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is our Lord, He is, he is our Creator. He has created certain things within us. He knows we have certain desires and needs. Because He is our Creator. He has created a need within the human, man or woman. All sorts of needs. We get hungry, we are thirsty. Right? We are hungry, we are thirsty. And there are many things, the temperament, the nature of the human, the way Allah has created human beings. He has created certain things because of a wisdom that Allah knows best. A human being, man or woman, naturally has this desire and need, which needs to be fulfilled, which is the desire of lust, which is a desire of, of wanting companionship from a member of the opposite gender, this desire to be in the company of the opposite gender. It's absolutely natural, normal. Don't worry. Right? Some, this brother once came to me and said, you know, I, I just have this little desire. I wish I don't have a desire. I mean, this somebody came to the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uthman ibn al-Mad'oon. It's in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari in Kitab al-Nikah. وَلَوْ أَذِينَ لَهُ لَخْتَصَيْنَا رَدَّ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَىٰ أُثْمَانِ أَتَبَدُّلَ He wanted to get castrated. He wanted to remove from him self the desire, the sexual desire, so that he can live in solitude. تَبَتُّلْ مِنْ تَرْكُ النِّكَاحِ To live a life of celibacy. And he asked the Messenger of Allah, who's Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can I live a life of celibacy? Which means that I, I, you know, live a life of celibacy, I don't have desires. وَلَوْ أَذِنَ لَهُ لَخْتَصَيْنَا Had the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, allowed him, the companions say, that لَخْتَصَيْنَا We would have got ourselves castrated, some of us. Which means, we just want to live in solitude. If that was the case, Allah wouldn't have created this. There's, there's a reason, there's a wisdom. All these natural desires created in the human being. Anger. You know, Allah, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said to one companion, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Messenger of Allah. He was in a hurry. He said, give me nasiha wa awjiz. Give me a short, brief nasiha. He said, la taghdab. Don't get angry. Second time. Faraddad mirara. La taghdab, la taghdab. Thrice. Now we know anger is wrong. We know anger is something we need to avoid. People go into you know, some anger management tra- treatment clinics. And we have, Islamically, Allah says in the Quran, we, we, we know there are ways of removing anger and controlling one's anger. Why did Allah create anger? If it was evil, in of itself it's not evil. It's the misuse of anger. And there's a reason because of which Allah created anger within us. Because it, there is a need, there are certain times, if you were absolutely passive, no anger whatsoever, somebody could come right in front of you and you know, your, your father, your mother, your parents, and you know, just slapping them around and hitting them and say, don't do that. It's not good. And someone's just literally, physically abusing your parents right in front of you. Don't 
Don't do that. <laughs> you don't get angry? Nothing makes you angry? No human being is like that. There's a wisdom behind it. Likewise, Allah has created this sexual desire, passion, lust in a human, man or a woman. It's absolutely normal, natural. And there's a wisdom. Because of that, we, have, we are here in this world. We wouldn't be here. There's a sexual desire, passion, because of which we were born. Of course, Allah is a khaliq, but there's the means. It's litanasul. To have a lineage, to have a progeny, to, to have people coming. Allah uses this as a apparent means of people, people coming into this world. So there's a, it's, it's absolutely natural, normal to have a sexual desire, a passion, lust within oneself. There's nothing wrong. Don't feel guilty about it. Okay? Don't feel guilty for having the desire. And also, some have less, some have more. That's absolutely normal. Just like some people have more anger, some have less anger, right? Some people have more anger, some have less. We've been created, you know, Allah has created us like that. You know, some, some people are very angry by nature. And we know, the people who are angry, they know themselves that yes, I, I really need to control myself. Because I'm very angry, I get very easily irritated, very easily angered. Some people are really cool, cool as a cucumber, you know, you can... Probably it takes them like something major for them to maybe even get up now, you know, something. But they're just so calm and cool about situations. Different people, we all look different. We all look different. Every human being is different from another. So Allah has created all of us differently. Even our temperaments, our natures, all separate. Some have less anger, some have more anger. Some have more sexual passion and lust, some have less. Nothing to worry about. The ones have more, doesn't mean you're you're somewhat a b bad Muslim or worse. No, it's not like that. What the difference is that you have to, the one who has more lust and more easily seduced by the opposite gender, your challenge is greater than someone who can control himself. That's what it is. The one who is more angry, there's more challenge on him. He has to really control himself from being angry. And some people, they just they don't really need to do that much. And Allah creates different things in different people. This is taqseem, division of Allah. So someone, some people have less, some have more. There's nothing wrong. Less, less, more, less. Sexual passion, desire. But the responsibility for us is that we need to control it, we need to channel it. Just like anger, we need to control it. There are only certain legitimate usages of anger. You can't have anger manifested in any way, shape or form. Likewise, lust and the sexual passion, it needs to be controlled. It needs to be controlled. And this is what Allah is saying in Surah Al-Mu'minun. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ The whole uh, few verses there. Those people, أفلح, those believers have success, salvation. فلاح. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِزَكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ And then Allah says وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ Those who preserve their private parts, their modesty. They guard their chastity. لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Except from the spouses. There's one legitimate halal usage. There's one area where your sexual passion can be manifested. There's only one area. And this is the Islamic approach of moderation. We need to remember this. You know, there's two extremes. There's an extreme to the right and there's an extreme to the left. In some faith communities, yeah, in some faith, classically, historically, certain faiths, and maybe even now, without going into taking names because... Nowadays you just even mention a name and, and I don't know what happens. But there's these faith communities. Um, certain faith communities you find even till today. There's one approach that lust, passion, sexual desire is evil, it's wrong, it's filthy, it's sinful, it's dirty, full stop. There is no way, there is no correct way of the manifestation of your sexual desire. There's no correct way. You just have to control it. It's bad evil, full stop. That's it. 
you have to strive, you have to struggle. This is what we call mujahada. That's what they say. In order to get close to God, in order to get close to Allah, proximity to God only comes by striving, struggling. You can't even do business and trade to make money in some faith communities. You can't even enjoy your food. Just eat a bit. You have this life is life of celibacy. This is what they call. This is what Allah called in the Quran, rahbaniya. Allah says, wa rahbaniya tadauha ma katabnaha alayhi. This is something which is Rahbaniya. Monasticism. It's called monasticism. Rahbaniya tadauha. They invented it for themselves. They wanted to live a life of solitude. No, 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 no marrying, no business trade, no eating, no socializing. Ma katabnaha alayhim. We never implemented or prescribed this for them. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Sunan of Imam Abu Dawood, he said, La sarurata fil Islam. And one of the main meanings of la sarurata is there is no celibacy. Another meaning is no leaving of hajj. But la sarurata, there is no celibacy. Tarkun nikah, avoiding marriage altogether. This is not Islam. So this was an extreme to the right, right? To the point that you know some of them they they said you can marry, but the husband and wife cannot even be alone in a room. If you want to, if you want to meet your husband or your wife, you you can only do it in a public place. You can't be alone. And they had nuns and monks living in monasteries. That's where it is. You know, this is an extreme approach. Lust is if you see if you see the Bible, if you see the, is one of the deadliest sins. The fourth deadliest sin is called lust. Right? Even even the other religions, they also consider lust to be generally sinful. So this is, there is, in some faith communities, there is no correct way of fulfilling one's desires and needs. It's wrong, sinful, full stop. You have to actually struggle and strive to get too close to God. On the other hand, we have an extreme left, which we find in today's time. Where there are no barriers, there are no conditions, there are no restrictions in how you fulfill your desires. We live in a time where you, a person is allowed to fulfill his or her needs, sexual needs and desires in any way, shape or form, without any conditions, without any contract, without any marriage, in any way with whoever, whether your own gender or another gender, or whatever. It doesn't even have to be a human nowadays. Yeah, seriously, I gave a whole course once, I mean, there's things, I mean, in any way, I mean, you see, it's ridiculous where society is going to. In any way, whoever, whatever, people fulfill the desires, I mean, you should know and you must know, with not even humans, with animals, with dead bodies, with this, within the family sometimes. The list can go on. There is no restriction, sometimes with force, without force, sometimes through, through oppression, rape, and all these things. Sexual crimes that take place. And we, we know, we all is here in the news, the sexual crimes that take place. Islam says, this is إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Middle way, the moderate way, the moderate middle path. God acknowledges that you have a sexual desire. Allah knows He created you, He knows that this desire needs to be fulfilled. Because if you go to the right extreme, you are challenging the fitrah of Allah. You are challenging what Allah wanted. And whenever you go against the natural way that Allah has created, you always end up, you always end up in chaos and anarchy and, and in the society. And that happened that those people who stayed away from marriage and they thought that they were able to control themselves, most of them could not. There's so many cases they could not. Behind closed doors, all sorts of things were being committed. Why? Because it's natural. You tell someone you can't fulfill your desires; it's unnatural. Because that's how Allah created a human being. And on the other hand, the other extreme as well, we find today, that's unnatural as well. How many children do not know? More than 50% of children in America. Right, I don't know what the percentage is here, maybe the same. Of children, newborn children do not have a clue who their father is. They don't have a clue. They don't know who their father is. I mean, that's a crime. Not just a crime in terms of fornication, but it's an oppression crime towards the son or the daughter, the child. Imagine, I mean that you grow up and you don't know who your father is. Your first right has been taken away as a human being. That's an inhumane act and that's a crime towards another human being. There's so many people, they, they grow up, they don't know. 
Why? Because of all these liberal, you know, tendencies towards sexuality. That you can fulfill your desires in any way, shape, or form. Islam says the middle way. The middle way, this is Islamic position, Islamic stance. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And then Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِفُرُوجِهِمْ حَافِظُونَ This is the middle way. إِلَّا عَلَىٰ أَزْوَاجِهِمْ Only, only through a valid halal marriage, a valid halal nikah, which brings two, two people close to one another. There's a spiritual bond and link that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places and attaches to the union that, is, that takes place through the union of nikah and marriage. Without that, it's, it's, the, the, it, there's no barakah in it. And, and we see all the problems. So there is no rahbaniya in Islam. There is no celibacy in Islam. There is no celibacy, there is no leaving of marriage. Islam says this is the halal way. Other than that, all the haram ways. Before marriage and even after marriage. All the halal ways, the haram ways, we have to avoid. This is the only, only soul way. Allah says in the Quran, "Wala taqrabu zina." Right, brothers and sisters, "Wala taqrabu zina." Allah says, "Don't forget fornication. Do not even come close to fornication." "Wala taqrabu qurb." "La taqrabu zina." Don't even smell it. Run away, a mile away from it. This is all explanation. That's not the translation. Run a mile away from it. The verse is, لا تقربوا الزنا Don't even approach it. Don't even come close to it. A woman, رجل دعته طلبته امرأة The hadith. A woman is trying to, you know, speak to you in a very flirtatious way. Or a brother is trying to, a man is trying to flirt with you. Run away. Just slap him. If a sister, if a brother tries to talk to you, just slap him one. <laughs> Just, just, just go away from it. Just do not. If you think something might happen, then that's it. You have to. You have to control yourself. And if somebody cannot control themselves, then just get married. Don't wait for anything. Just get married. No, seriously. You, have, you know, I, I just, I actually gave a whole weekend course. Last weekend, I was not even in England. I was in Oslo, Norway. Friday till Sunday. The Saturday, Sunday, we had a fiqh of marriage and divorce course. And they were, it was in the university, University of Oslo. There was a lot of people. We had about 150 people who came for the whole course. And the main question and the main thing that was coming up because I really focused in the beginning, I do not wait around to get married. I said parents need to be told as well. That there's too many cultural practices, too many self-imposed restrictions. We live in a climate, in a time where there's a lot of fitna. It's very difficult in this day and age. In this day and age to avoid sin, it's very, very difficult. I can understand. Especially in universities and places. I'm not trying to justify it, but I can understand. Right? I mean, I don't study in, in UCL or Imperial or whatever. Right? I, I am, there's no women there. So I know it's very difficult for you. I can stand here and tell you, you know, just be Allah. And it is very difficult. It is very difficult. There are a lot of temptations out there. You're in the midst of a lot of trial and tribulation. But that's, that's the challenge. That is the challenge. The more difficult, the greater the reward. But the, yeah, so I said I focused a lot on marriage. Don't wait. Don't, you know, all these self-imposed restrictions, cultural restrictions. There was, there was, I remember a sister asked a question, she was a Moroccan sister, and she's 16, and after that she was going to be 17, she said, is it too early for me to get married? I said, no. And she really wanted to get married. I remember, it's just, this on Sunday. I really focused, I said, get married at an early, don't wait, don't wait, you don't have to graduate. You don't have to, because... You know, the, the type of financial things we have in our heads and minds, like there was a Palestinian brother who used to be a good friend of mine once when I was studying in Syria, and he used to tell me that it's so difficult to marry here, in Syria and places like that, because there's, nobody will give you their daughter unless you don't have three keys, key to your car, key to your house, and key to your business. Namahar dowry extortion amah. These are all self-imposed restrictions. You can't get married until your great grandfather doesn't come back from Punjab or something. <laughs> you know, this uncle has to come from there, and that uncle has to come from there, and from India, or whatever. People have to. You have to wait for the whole world. I mean, look at the time of the Sahaba, the Messenger of Allah, one sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He saw Abdul Rahman ibn Auf, radiyallahu anhu, a companion. He saw him. He didn't see him. He saw him with a yellow stain on his clothes. He said, "Oh, Abdul Rahman, what's this yellow color?" He said, oh, um, last week I got married, 
When I applied some perfume, it's probably some effect of the fragrance. I said, oh, you got married last week. Yeah, I got married. So what? Believe. I ate food, I had breakfast. <laughs> it's like that, seriously. That's how the Sahaba were. And he said, oh, but he, he never even complained. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not complain. He never said, oh, you didn't call me. You know, like some Imam today said, Astaghfirullah, you got married. Where's my invitation? Did I call you when I was having breakfast? No. It's just a simple, seriously, that's what Muslims thought about marriage, simplicity. No restrictions, no conditions, simple as possible. People, this is how people are satisfied. Parents make it difficult, we live in a time when things are made difficult on young people. And if Islam allows you, fulfill your desires in the best of ways, in the halal ways. And it's, it's a natural desire. It's difficult to control it. So then get married in a halal way. Allah will place barakah. Allah will place barakah. But outside marriage, don't even get close to fornication. Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." Anything that leads to it. Anything that leads to it. وَلَا تَقْرَبُ zina." إِنَّهُ كَانَ fahisha. It's evil. And then Allah says, وَسَاءَ sabila." It opens the doors to other sins. لا يزني الزاني حين يزني وهو مؤمن. Iman, the person does not even remain a mu'min when he's at the time of fornicating. Anything that even takes you to fornication needs to be avoided. This is what Islam says. Before marriage as well. You cannot before marriage. Dating is out of the question. For Muslims, dating and having a you know, illicit relationship, even if you don't, do not, even if you do not go all the way to actual illegal sexual intercourse, even to the point that Islam says, casting a lustful gaze, casting a lustful gaze, I'm talking about lustful gaze, right? As a member of the opposite gender is clearly condemned in the Quran. قُلِ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُدْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ وَيَحْفَظْنَ فُرُوجَهُنَّ Tell the believing men to lower the gaze and preserve their modesty. Tell the believing women to lower the gaze. Because it leads to, one thing leads to another. You know, once there'll be a look and then there'll be a smile and then it'll be in the bedroom. Or somewhere, no, sorry, a look and then a smile and then in the coffee shop. Right? And then maybe in the library. And then in the bedroom. Yeah, one thing leads to another. You know for a fact, one thing leads to another. This is this is how we have been created. We, you know, the sexual the sexual instinct is the weakest instinct of the human being, and Shaytan knows that. Iblis, Satan knows that. This is where that this guy can slip. The attack is on the sexual instinct. It's it's the most easiest way. People of piety have slipped. People who've been living a life of righteousness, of religiosity. People who've been practicing, God-fearing people. There are cases in history where this sexual instinct, a sin there, just made them slip and they went far away from the path of Islam. Shaitan knows. He knows. He knows. He knows the game. He knows our weaknesses. It's a very. It's, it's one of the greatest weaknesses we have, especially in this time. So before marriage, just avoid it completely. Listen. You know, Allah says in the Quran. Fear Allah. This fear of Allah. You know, at the time of marriage, we are reminded of taqwa. This taqwa has to be before marriage, at the time of marriage, even after. Before marriage specifically as well. Don't think to yourself, I'm not married, let me just mess around right now. Because I tell you one thing, and I've said this on a lot of occasions. Once you get a habit of messing around, that habit will remain with you until you're a six-year-old Buddha. You know what a Buddha is, yeah? I mean, the Asians know that. Until you're a six-year-old old man. You're a sheikh. Sheikh actually means an old man in Arabic. But we use it, you know, shaykh, whatever. But literally speaking, linguistically, shaykhun and shaykhatun. Shaykh means an old man. Shaykha means an old woman. But we use it for imams and, and people. It's just, it's just a terminology. It's not, it's not an Islamic terminology. Whatever, like in different places, different countries, people use different terms, whatever. But you, if, you, if we do not sort ourselves out before marriage, that remains a habit even after marriage. That's why it's highly important that if you want to get married before marriage, at least six, seven months, a year before, just make tawbah to Allah, repent. Live a life of six months to a year of chastity. Live a life of chastity, then get into marriage. Because if you get into marriage on the back of 
unlawful things that you've done, and I'm not just talking about zina and fornication, but I'm talking about anything that leads to it and anything that's related to it. From castful, lustful gazes to whatever, all the things that we know people do sometimes in privacy. Right? Everything. All of the things. If we do not control ourselves before marriage, then after marriage, that's why we have problems in marriages. I speak to people on a regular basis. Where men specifically who have had habits before marriage carries on into the marriage and some are apparently looking they're practicing apparently externally but they've got these habits in privacy that they've been doing before marriage I mean I've spoken to so many women like that wives who've got children and those habits are not dying they cannot control their habits because there was no taqwa before the fear of Allah before marriage before I remember you know these relationships they don't work before marriage they don't work without a doubt it's not going to the sister first of all for the sisters don't get deluded and deceived into a brother saying I want to marry you and all of that you know it's just tell if you want to marry me you know you, 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 you won't have a relationship you're just not su- suitable anyway you're going to do this today when I'm married you probably do that and he will. if he's got a habit right now you'll be married to him and after five years he's going to do that with someone else I know hundreds of cases and I speak to people on a regular basis I have a 6 to 8 phone line where people call me on a regular basis. Emails, I have a Q&A website. On a regular basis, this is one of the mainstream problems. Marital problems are the biggest problems in today's society. Everywhere in the West. Divorces are on the high, on the rise. Everywhere in the West. When, when I was in Toronto, the, they were telling me that one in four Muslim marriages end up in divorce. In Canada. One in four. It's a big problem. One of the reasons is because of what we see in front of us with the fitna. So, if, if he's doing that with you today, then he is not suitable to be married. Just slap him and tell him to go. You know, he's not suitable for marriage because he's going to carry on like this after marriage as well. And also, brothers, you know, sisters who like that thing, just, just avoid, don't, you know, do not be seduced. Control yourselves. And if you really want, want to like someone's habits, then, then get married. Before marriage, you know, some people say, oh, how can you get married if you, can't, if you can't date? There's no feelings before marriage. You know, in Islam, love only starts after marriage. They say, you know, one of the sheikhs, one of them said that. They say in the West that love is a madness that ends with marriage. We say in Islam, love is a madness that only begins with marriage. There's a hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Which is a sound hadith in the Sunnah of Imam Ibn Majah. He said, "Lam tara lil mutahabaini mithl al nikah." You won't see anything that creates more love between two people like marriage. The special barakah and blessings granted by Allah before marriage, you can, you know, you cannot create feelings. It's lust before marriage. It's not love. It's lust, and it's just you cannot get to know anyone before. It's impossible. Look, I tell you. You know, you think, okay, let me get to know this person, this sister, this brother, six months, you know. I want to date them, I want to find out how they are. You know, for six months, for a year, it will all be artificial behavior. No one's the true self. I mean, do you live together? Are you 24 hours 7 together? Are you 24 7 together? Are you sleeping together? Are you, are you waking up? With, I, I, you know, do you see this woman? Like, after marriage, you'll see her every time. You see her the moment she wakes up with makeup, without makeup, the moment she's come out from the toilet, the moment, you know, she's in the kitchen, she's got an apron on, she's smelling of curry. You'll see her. She's, and like the brother as well, you'll see her on all occasions. And when you're dating, you're getting dressed up for the occasion. Friday, Saturday, you know, all the perfume and fragrance and the brother, you know, he's like he's shaving or whatever. If he's, you know, trimming and... Yeah, inshallah, he shouldn't be shaving. But, um, you know, he's, just, he's, he's putting on, you know, his nice best gear and this and that. And he's trying to impress. And then he comes and picks the sister up and everything. And it's all dating. It's all artificial. It's just, it's just artificial behavior. He's not, he's not his normal self. And then he goes and, you know, outside it's so it's cold. And he's probably take his jacket off. Sister, sister, here, you know. You're feeling cold. It's right. You have my jacket. Wear my jacket. And then, you know, open the door for the car. You sit in a restaurant, you know. It's cool. You sit down, you know. Will you do that after two years, ten years of marriage? You're not going to do that after two years of marriage. <laughs> it lasts for two, one month, after month, one month, after he's been where he's been, and, and he's had the relationship. Most of them are not going to do that. That's why I tell the people, be your normal self. How are you going to be after 30 years of marriage? Be like that on the first day of marriage. No expectations. And then sisters think, wow, this brother, 
she's always so good, he treats me so good, you know, he really, he treats me so well. And then, they get married, and he's no longer like that. What happens? He gets disappointed, she gets disappointed. And that leads to divorce. That's why I don't have any expectations. That's why dating will never, you will never, never get to know someone. Because you're not living with them. You're not, you're not living 24-7. You're not sharing everything and anything. You're not going to buy nappies together. You're not paying the bills together. Seriously, this is reality of life. Whereas, what, what does Islam say? Find out everything about them. Not through them, but through third party. You can meet them, have a meeting, attraction and things like that. But then do your investigation and research. I'm concluding, Shah, but do your investigation and research through people. Find out all the qualities, all the attributes, all the negatives, all the positives. Do as much research as you can from third party sources. Whether he's angry, whether he's not angry, whether she's someone who's always fighting, quarreling and bickering with everyone. Is he a jealous person? Is she a jealous woman? Does, does she always backbite? Does she always bicker? Does she always fight? Or is she someone that's really clean hearted and just is very simple, clean hearted, doesn't have no grudges towards anybody? You can find this out from third party sources. And that will keep, maintain your marriage. That will help the marriage. So before marriage, we have to be very careful. No, Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina. Even castful, lustful, casting lustful gazes and all the other sins that we know. Right? We need to control ourselves. We need to take the means. I'm going to end with this. Look at the story of Yusuf, peace be upon him. He took the means. وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهِ عَنْ نَفْسِهِ وَرَاوَدَتْهُ الَّتِي هُوَ فِي بَيْتِهَا عَنْ نَفْسِهِ You know, uh, the, the, the one whose house فِي بَيْتِهِ عَنْ نَفْسِهَا the, the, the master and, and she was the, uh, the, the wife of the, the, the king of Misr. She seduced him. She, tried, she wanted to have an unlawful, illicit relationship with him. Nobody in the house. She locked, bolted the doors, locked. Where are you going to go? I'm a woman here now. And she was no ordinary woman. She was, again, Imra'atu Jamal, Dhatu Jamal in Wansar. She was beautiful as well as she was princess, the queen. She's a queen. And she locked the doors. And she wanted to have an unlawful, illicit sexual relationship with him. What did he say? قَالَ مَعَاذَ اللَّهِ said, I take, I take refuge and protection in Allah. And then in the Quran, he ran, it says, he ran, you know, he ran towards the doors. He did whatever was his, in his, you know, the doors were locked. But Yusuf, what did he do? He never thought to himself, but look, the doors are locked. If I go there, what's going to happen anyway? She'll come there. <coughs> right? He never thought that. He ran to the doors. He did what was in his means. He knows that. Look, I can run from here to there. From there, it's not in my hands. Then I leave it to Allah. He ran to the doors. He did what was in his capability, his means. Left the rest to Allah. Allah opened the doors automatically. He kept on running and the doors were being opened. She tried to pull him in the back. It's all in the Quran, in the story of Yusuf. So we have to, this is a challenge. We have to try our best, brothers and sisters. I know there's a lot of questions on this topic. We can carry on and on and on. But we're just going to end here, inshallah. Questions? We have to be um, okay, so due to the time constraints, we have time for about three questions from the brothers and from the sisters. So um, I'll take questions from the brothers first and the questions come down from the sisters. So any questions? No? Okay, take the questions from the sisters side first.
on the Friday evening, the University of Oxford, inshallah, a lot of Muslims, there, there are many Asians of the Pakistan background, majority of Muslims. There are a lot of people from Morocco, a lot of Moroccan Muslims, a few Lebanese, Syrian ones as well, Somalians, a lot of people from Somalia as well, Turks. And mashallah, they're really struggling there and striving. I mean, they, they have certainly been in the university that we, we take it for granted here. We take it for granted. You know, for them to even write on the doors, this is a sister's entrance, and this is a brother's entrance, they can't do that. The university is will ban the Islamic society, the ISOC, the NSA, the university, from having any programs if you do the segregation, the discrimination. You can't, you can't say brothers sitting here, sisters. You can't even put a door as an entrance. And you can't. And if, if a sister wants to come here, sit here, you have to. Or if a brother wants to go and sit down there, anybody stands up and says, Brother, you need to sit here, your society is there. And they're very straight down there. I mean, it's some of the things that you can kind of make. So this was my third visit to ignore it, but some of the things we take for granted. And they're really thirsty for knowledge. And they say, Look, you know, we had, we had a program on Friday evening on the Islamic finance. I gave a talk for about an hour and a few minutes on the Islamic finance. The lectures is absolutely jam packed, absolutely jam packed. The main one people you know, the people don't, you know, they the desire not there because we have a lot. You know, we have, you know, so many Muslims, we have everything, so we don't have that desire to learn about Islam. Courses and things like that we don't sometimes. Anyway, uh, if a brother was interested in a sister or a sister in you know, a brother for the purpose of learning what is it? Islamic way of in a sister or a sister in you know, a brother what is this kind of way of proposing to them is there a case difference for brothers and sisters no there's no difference there's no difference of between a brother wanting to get married to a sister and, or a sister wanting to propose to a brother there's no difference neither is it Islamically necessary for a proposal to come from a brother or from a sister there's nothing wrong you know we some cultures I think oh the sister side's proposing I will stop it all along where's that from <laughs> Where is that from? There's, there's nowhere in Islam like that. The sister can propose. It's in the Quran. Shu'ayb, peace be upon him, his daughter wanted to marry Musa, peace be upon him. And she indicated that. She said in the Quran, which Allah is uh, relating from her, that in the khayra man istajart al qawiyya lameen, that this is the best person of Jal you can employ. He has two amazing qualities, which is that he's qawi, he's powerful, he's strong, and he's ameen, he's trustworthy. That's in the Quran. And then if you look in the commentaries of the Quran, the Mufassirun, Ibn Kathir, and others, they say she indicated that she wanted to marry. And she suggested to her father that, like, I like him, can I get married to him? Is there anything wrong? There's nothing wrong. So the, it's the same in both situations. Now, in terms of how do you propose, you have to use the halal channels, halal ways. Yeah? You have to avoid, there are a lot of things that are haram. Khalwa is haram, being alone in a secluded area. I was going to talk about all of that. Seclusion is totally haram. A man and a woman la yakhluwanna rajulun bi imra'atin illa kana thalithuhuma shaytan. Never is a man and a woman alone in isolation in a room. The third one amongst them is shaytan. That's what the hadith says. You can't, what, again, what else is unlawful? You can, as I said, dating is not allowed. I also said that uh, flirtatious conversation, even for the, with the intention of marriage, a man and a woman cannot, a person cannot talk with a member of the opposite gender who is not a mahram to you, to her or to him, in a flirtatious manner, in a way, you can talk, but in a way that is considered flirtatious. And when they do talk, when there is an interaction, even if it's for marriage, which means you want to know them, some things about them, you can't be alone. The, both two things, you need to remember, two things, the content and the manner has to be Islamically valid and appropriate. The content and the manner. The content, what you are talking about, needs to be something that's essential, important, necessary. Otherwise, you can't just start having a chat, you know, yeah, how's things, what's happening, what's, how's life, you know, things, those... No, the content has to be appropriate. And the manner, you know the manner? You know what the manner means? 
the method, the words you use, you can't be relaxed, you can't be flirtatious, you can't, you know. This is in the Quran, Allah said, فَلَا تَخْضَعْنَ بِالْقَوْلِ Do not be soft. Allah was addressing women and He said, Do not be soft in your tone. Do not make your voices soft like, Hi brother, how are you? Oh, you know, don't be like that. When this verse was revealed, if you look in the tafsir, they said that some of the female companions used to put their hands over their mouths. Just intentionally, deliberately making their voices rough to scare away those people who have fi qalbihi marad, the one, the man who has a diseased heart. So don't be very soft in your tone as well. That's what the Quran says. Don't. So anyway, in terms of proposal, use the rightful channel. Speak to you can speak to your parents, family members. Try to you know ask them if you like someone. Speak to your parents. If the, if the parents are not willing, then there are ways. I mean, it's another topic altogether how to deal with your parents. But halal channels. Avoiding any sort of flirtatious conversation and avoiding being alone in seclusion, which is haram. Not talking about anything which is not required. Always try to meet in the company of others. Have your wali there, your mahram there, someone there. If you can't, then at least third party. Do, do it. Don't do it directly. Do, do it through some people. Like if there's a brother who wants to get married to his sister, and then do it through someone. Like find out if the, you know, if that sister's brother's relative, someone. So you go from one, two, three, four, five links. And if you want to do email, then CC everyone in and BC everyone in. So everybody knows what's going on. Uh, one of the brothers were a bit, was a bit shy, so he's written his question down as well. That's fine. No, no, brothers can also write. No, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, I actually write written questions. Everywhere, I should forgot. So I always just write. I, I, sorry, I always like written questions. No, not verbal, so even for brothers. What attributes are most important looking for a spouse? Oh, this is a topic. I gave a t- one and a half to two hours talk on this just session. But I'll tell you a summary. Three main attributes. When do we have to finish Q&A? Uh, uh, ten, ten minutes? Ten minutes. I don't know what time my train is as well, I'm not too sure. Sorry? Uh, it's eight. My train, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So fifteen. Okay. It's expecting now. Okay. Just briefly, there's three main characteristics. Three main. Number one, you know the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعِينَ لِمَالِهَا وَلِنَسَبِهَا وَلِجَمَالِهَا وَلِدِينِهَا فَاطْفُرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ People marry for different reasons. A woman is married. Again, this is not restricted to a woman. A woman or a man. He doesn't have to mention everything double. So a woman is married normally for four reasons. But even a man, people marry for deen, and jamal, beauty, whatever. He said, فَاطْفُرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ Ensure your primary consideration is deen. Okay? So the number one is deen. But the problem is that we have misunderstood the term deen. Religion, religiosity. Everybody knows the first primary consideration is what? Deen. And I'll tell you one thing, brothers and sisters. The only thing that will retain your marriage, the only aspect that will ensure that you have a blissful, prosperous marriage, is that if you find a woman or a man who, who has a quality of deen in them. Seriously, you think about the long term. You know, sometimes when young people get married, they don't, look at it, they don't think about long term. Remember this marriage is not for two days. Remember this marriage is when you're 92 years old, if Allah gives you that long life, or if you're until 60. And you're an old man, and you're an old woman. And she's 62, and you're 64. Or you're 63, and she's 64. Right? That's also possible. Think about that. There's a hadith in the Sunan of Imam Ibn Majah, right? That the chain is not considered to be that authentic, according to most scholars, but some have said it's authentic. Select a right person, a suitable person for for your nutaf, your, your, your sperm, which means the Messenger of Allah is trying to say that when you are considering who you want to marry, think about who you want as a potential mother for your child and a father for your child. Don't be selfish and think about your needs. The first right you owe to your children is to select a good mother or father for them. Just imagine. So think about it. Who do I want as a mother for my child? Just someone who looks good? That's it? That's it? You want to think about children, marriages, it's not just, you know, just about the bedroom. It's not just about the bedroom, it is about the bedroom, a very important part, as, as the brothers know, and I wrote a book as well about that, Islamic Guide to Sexual Relations. 
So it is, it's very important about the bedroom. Yeah, but it's not just about that, it's about so many different things. So deen, yeah, we all know deen is very important. We all know. But we've misunderstood what deen is. What is deen? Some people think deen, is it just to wear a hat? Is that just deen? Is it just to grow a beard? Is that deen? Is it just to wear a hijab? Is that deen? It is deen, but it's not just that. It's much more. And there's different branches, A, B, C, D, of deen. Aqa'i, the one's aqidah first and foremost, then the person's ibadat, external worshipping of Allah. And number three, mu'amalat, financial transactions. When you're thinking about a brother to get married to a sister, you need to ask and investigate whether he's someone whose monetary dealings are according to the rules of Islam or not. Find out that does he take a loan from his friend and he says, I'll pay you next week. Does he pay in a week or does it take 10 weeks to pay? If it's someone who's not paying his debts on time, then don't, don't marry him. Because he's got a problem, he's got a disease. Love of dunya, this is mu'amalat. This is mu'amalat, financial transactions. He needs to someone who will be able to provide halal income in the house. Not, not working in a haram industry, because then the wife and children cannot even eat from that money. Haram food is not just alcohol and ingredients, it's the money that you use as well to buy halal food. So the man has to provide halal income to provide for the financial support. Think about his mu'amalat. Mu'ashir is another area of deen. Personal character, behavior, akhlaq, character, the spiritual diseases. You know, you have to think when you want a sister to get married to, find out does she have jealousy. Is she a jealous individual or not? If she's got the disease of jealousy, you want to stay away. Because she'll be jealous about everything and it causes problems. How many marriages are broken down because of jealousy of one of the spouses? Of anything. Because one brother said to me that I just, you know, by mistakenly, I'm just looking like sister and she's like nearly about to punch me. <laughs> she gets so jealous. She, in, she's, into, she's got this, you know, disease within her that she's very insecure. Now, it needs to be worked upon, of course, but jealousy is, is a, a very sinful, sinful disease. Backbiting, someone who just wastes time all the time on the mobile phone and talking about the whole world except themselves. Right, just backbiting, evil, bickering, you know, all his grudges, bickering and fighting, not talking to this sister, not talking to that brother. Another quarrel, you just come out from one dispute and you end in another dispute. She's not talking to her and he's not talking to her. These are diseases. That's what you need to look at, especially in marriage. More than even the hijab, I feel personally. Hijab is important. Even in a brother, external application is important. But in marriage, these things have a more impact. Because it's a personal relationship. So you have deen, and number three is attraction. Attract, so you have deen, sorry, number two. Number two is compatibility. Compatibility. Compatibility, again, I don't have time. You know, I can explain compatibility for ten minutes. But there's a lot of things in compatibility. It doesn't mean you have to be from the same caste, or the same background. It doesn't have to be your, my dad's, you know, my brother's son's daughter back in, you know, the same village and alleyway in, in Kashmir or somewhere. It doesn't have to be that. It can be anyone. But you have same aims, same goals, same interests in life, same thoughts, same, same level, same intellect. You're, the man's dumb and the, the, the wife is so sharp, you can have problems. <laughs> She's going to take you for a ride every single time. And it's going to cause problems. She will lose respect for the man. You're immature, the man is really immature. Maturity is a very important quality. Maturity, you're right? It's very... It's, and, and that's why a lot of sisters, they don't like immature people. I remember a sister a few weeks ago, she emailed, and she, 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 the question was, can I get married to somebody who's like 10 years older than me? I remember, I can't remember the ages. Like, I think she was 19 or something, and the guy's 29, I don't know. I say, Islamically is fine, but the, yeah, the, the reason she said, she goes, because I find most brothers in my age gap all immature. <laughs> I find them all immature, childish. That they pass air, gas, and wind and start laughing. Is that something to laugh about? Is that something to laugh about? Is that some immature things, right? So anyway, maturity. But compatibility is very important. Compatibility. Same intellectual level, same understanding, same interests, same hobbies. And number three is attraction. You have to be attracted. You can't get married to somebody who you're not attracted because, you know, then your chast- one of the objectives of marriage is chastity. So, you know, Attraction. These are main three, but there are many others as well. Oh, I said 135 questions. Now everybody's asking questions quickly. Uh, um, well, last question. Okay. I can't read this one. No more questions. Okay. Yeah. 
Minute okay, if I can just maybe see one one minute answer or 30 seconds. Casting a lustful gaze, does this apply also if you see an image of a handsome celebrity? Yeah, 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 of course. I, I was going to say lustful gaze, whether it's in the open or, or on, the, on the TV, on the screen or on the billboard, you know, the, you know it's, it's, it's lustful gaze, absolutely hard. You know, it makes you spiritually go so low when you cast an unlawful gaze. Uh, let's cast a lustful gaze on someone of the opposite gender. May Allah protect us. We have to save ourselves. Um, if a sister is more practicing than a brother, then should she still get married to him? Yeah, it depends. You can. There's no problem. But it depends. If you think that you can, inshallah, help him, and he's someone that who you will able to help and make practicing, then go for it. If you think that his habits will rub off on you, then avoid it. Um, sorry? No more time anymore. You sure? Yeah. I don't, I don't, that's, I don't mind. I mean, it's just... Because you know they've asked questions, so I think it's not it's not nice. I'm um, just quickly, being left alone in a room or left with a man. What if you can't help it? Meeting supervisor. Yeah, you see, if you're in a place khalwa, which the definition of which is it's haram, is being in a place where third party cannot enter easily. The door is locked, bolted. You're alone by yourself, and nobody can enter easily. Yeah, like medics, for example. A lot of medics have asked me this question that you know you have a patient, it's one to one. But the door, you know, it's open, people can there's a view into the room, so that's not technically speaking khalwa. But still try to avoid that unless there's a need. Uh, this one, what should a sister do if she's not allowed to get married? Her partner has said that she can only get married at his, her parents, sorry, have said, she's not, have said that she can only get married at a certain age. Can you... Okay, this is for an email that she wants to answer an email. Okay, we'll see inshallah. I can't read this one, so let's leave that one. When I can't read it, I don't answer. <laughs> I need good handwriting. Please explain the meaning that would help control desires. Yeah, there's like fasting is in the Quran, uh, in the Hadith. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to control. Married, get married. That's number one. And also, who said, "Man istata'a minkum al-ba'a, ya ma'ashir al-shabab, man istata'a minkum al-ba'a, fa liyatazawaj." And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Wa man lam yastati', whoever cannot get married." But remember, whoever cannot is not what we think in our understanding that you need to get twenty thousand pounds before you get married. Meaning the person is absolutely destitute. That's why the scholars say, the fuqaha, the jurists, based on the, the, you know, the text, that somebody who has enough amount of money to support and provide for the first month, he is well enough. And there's nothing should be preventing him from getting married. You know, we have too much expectation, and that's why we make things difficult for us. The more we close the doors for halal, the more doors of haram open up. Simple. That's what it is. We've made marriage difficult for us. Doors of halal, we've closed them. All the doors of haram are open, and people are doing haram since. So fasting is a strong, effective way. Okay, try that as well. And there's another question about the fear of Allah, which is the question. Just okay. for answering all the questions. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. On Saturday, we have um, another event being held here. It's called the beginning, the end. Uh, Muslim Muhammad ibn Adam will be here for, for that as well. I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah, if I can just quickly talk yeah. about that. It's the Islamic Medical Ethics Conference. I advise most of the medics, if not all, if you can come. It's a, uh, it's a very good conference. There's going to be many discussions, uh, primarily Islamic medical ethics. It's a whole day conference. We're going to look at abortion from an Islamic perspective, the rules of abortion in Islam. Look, look at organ donation, blood transfusion, euthanasia. I have two uh, presentations, one on abortion and euthanasia. Both from an Islamic perspective. And there's some other speakers, they will name here the Sheikh Haytham Tamim and Dr. Isa Al Ghannam. Actually, he's one of the. Uh, and so, a few others are coming, inshallah. So, brothers, sisters, especially medics, right? If you can come, because you need to know about Muslim medics, need, not just medics, any, in any field you are in, you must learn the fiqh of that field as a Muslim. You know, Sayyidina Umar ibn Khattab, radiallahu anhu. He, when he became a Khalifa, he passed a verdict that whoever doesn't learn the fiqh, the rules of business and trade, فَلَا يَدْخُلَنَّ أَسْوَاقَنَا He banned the entry into the market. You can't come and do business in our market before going and, going and studying the rules of Islamic finance. Only then, because you're going to corrupt everyone else. So medics need to learn about medicine, people studying law need to know about the Islamic regulations about law. Accountancy, there are laws of Islam about accountancy, about everything and anything. So especially for medics, it's this Saturday, inshallah, all day long. I don't know what time it starts, I forgot. It's after 10? It's about uh, half past 10, 10 yeah, till about, uh, what time is the end? 5, 6 p.m. Yeah. Half past 10 it starts, inshallah. Okay.